right. Hello, everyone. Good to see you. Uh, delighted you're here. Congratulations on making the top 12. Uh, we we're going to be talking about unit two, question one. Uh, so we're going to have some uh, interesting discussions here. I'll inter we'll introduce ourselves and you guys introduce and then we'll uh, launch in, of course. My name is Thomas Mackey. I'm in the history department at the University of Louisville and with the law school here at the University of Louisville. Good afternoon. I'm Dan Taubman. I'm a senior judge on the Colorado Court of Appeals in Denver, Colorado. I'm Lindsay Draper. I am currently vice president for diversity, equity, and inclusion of the Institute for Wellbeing and Law. And I always tell this team how thrilled I am that you all are here because I'm also a Seattle University grad. <laughs> the fix is in. Yeah, no. <laughs> Please introduce yourselves. Hello, judges. My name is Luke Shirell, and my favorite founding father is Patrick Henry for his defense of individual liberties. Hello, judges. My name is Caitlin Thorpe, and my favorite founding father is George Washington for his strong leadership and his willingness to lead a country right from the start. Hello, judges. My name is Sophia Adams, and my favorite founding father is Alexander Hamilton for his contributions to the ratification of the Constitution through his writings in the Federalist Papers. On behalf of Unit 2, Tahoma High School, our advisor Gretchen Wolfing in the state of Washington, we thank you for judging us today. Cool. Good stuff. Well, let me read the question, and then uh, we'll get you started, okay? Uh, question one reads as follows. What were the major disagreements among the 55 delegates during the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, and how were they resolved? What issues, if any, were not resolved, and what were the consequences? What changes, if any, should be made to the Constitution? You may begin. To suppose that any form of government will secure liberty or happiness without any virtue in the people is a chimerical idea. James Madison. Issues regarding representation were among the largest disagreements that the delegates of the Philadelphia Convention were forced to resolve. While transitioning away from the Articles of Confederation, states were left to face an impasse between delegations between large and small states over how to apportion representation in the national legislature. Proposed resolutions included James Madison's Virginia Plan, arguing for a bicameral legislature with proportional representation. Directly opposed was the New Jersey plan drafted by William Patterson, introducing a unicameral Congress with equal representation. After extensive debate, the delegates eventually adopted the Great Compromise, establishing proportional representation in the House of Representatives under Article I, Section 2, and equal representation in the Senate under Article I, Section 3. This was a conclusion Madison later supported in Federal 62. The government ought to be founded on the mixture, mixture of the principles of proportional and equal representation. With the House of Representatives set to be based on state population, slave state proposed that every enslaved person be counted as part of their population. Future Vice President Eldridge Jerry opposed such an idea, asking why should the blacks who are property in the South be in rule of representation more than the cattle and the horses of the North? This debate was ultimately solved with the establishment of Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3, the Three-Fifths Compromise. The issue of citizenship remained unresolved at the convention, creating unforeseen consequences that continue to affect the United States post-ratification. Even though Article 2, Section 1, Clause 5 does mention citizens, an explicit definition is never given in the body of the Constitution. In Dred Scott v. Sanford, 1857, Dred Scott, an enslaved man, followed his owner to the free states of Illinois and Louisiana. Scott's owner argued that under Article 3, Section 2, Clause 1, African Americans were not citizens of the United States. And without a clear definition of citizenship, Scott did not have a viable case. Without clearly defining a citizen, the ability to protect individual rights is limited. Anti-Federalists advocated for the explicit protections for individual rights However, those rights did not extend to all living on American soil. Slave codes were introduced to outline what rights were granted to those who were not citizens. On December 6, 1865, slavery was officially abolished by the ratification of the 13th Amendment, which also meant the end of slave codes. However, in 1877, Jim Crow laws were established which legalized segregation towards African Americans. 
The perpetuation of this battle for equality has continued due to the lack of explicit definitions of citizenship and rights in the Constitution. Amendments regarding the Electoral College and advancements of privacy would strengthen the Constitution. To better represent the people of the United States, an amendment to the Electoral College found in Article 2, Section 1, Clause 3 is necessary. Options such as the Congressional District Method, Ranked Choice Voting, or a Complete Migration to a direct election would all aid in a more representative outcome for the American people in federal elections. Aside from federal elections, privacy is never explicitly mentioned within the body of the Constitution and was only addressed with the addition of the Bill of Rights and judicial interpretations of Griswold v. Connecticut, 1965. With advancements in technology, the Constitution needs an amendment protecting citizens against the third party doctrine. Established in Katz v. United States, 1967, the third party party doctrine bypasses the Fourth Amendment warrant requirement by stating that people who voluntarily give information to third parties have no reasonable expectation of privacy. A proposed amendment would extend the Fourth Amendment warrant requirements to government officials trying to obtain information collected by third parties. You're good? Thank you. Oh, okay, cool. I'm sorry. I it ends, I, I was hoping I, I thought to be more of a conclusion. That's fine. Um, well, interesting. Um, lots to chew on here with the 18th century and what they did and what they didn't say. Um, you do, I think where I want to start is you're, you do mention the reconstruction amendments. And in particular, I, I want to talk about at least briefly the 14th amendment because the first sentence of the 14th Amendment does define citizenship. It says all persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens of the United States and the state uh, that they live in. Um, so uh, help me understand the relationship of what is sometimes called the second American Constitution, the 14th Amendment, and the 1787 Constitution, if you could. Specifically on your point of citizenship, within the body of the Constitution, it's mentioned three specific times. You look towards Article 1, Section 2, Clause 2, the, uh, uh, the requisites in order to become a representative, Article 1, Section 3, Clause 3, the requisite, requisites to be a senator, and as we mentioned before, Article 2, Section 1, Clause 5, the requirements in order to be a president. And throughout those times, you have this, de this idea that citizenship is mentioned, but within the body, there is no direct definition. This was largely in favor because of the slavery debates between what should be accounted in the House of Representatives and what should not, basically upon how those uh, states should be apportioned their representatives. So you, talk, you talked in your opening statement about um, the issue of representation. Um, could you tell to us a little bit about the issue of the role of the executive and the creation of the presidency that the founding fathers uh, addressed? Well, one of the biggest arguments of the Anti-Federalists was the vagueness of Article 2, which is the executive, I mean, yeah, Article 2, which is the executive branch. But with that, we have also seen how with different interpretations of the executive branch, we can see how different administrations perceive the abilities of the executive branch and what is granted to the power of the president. You can also see representation in terms of how we elect our executive branch, how we elect our president. Under Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3, <clears throat> the census draws lines every 10 years that proportion, excuse me, that apportion representation towards the districts that will then be used to vote in the Electoral College for the, um, the amount, excuse me, the amount of House votes that you have and later the um, excuse me, the executive branch. And so with the breakup of the Electoral College, we can see that that was how the framers plan to have representation directly based in voting for the executive. So let me refocus my question. I, I was interested in hearing from you what debates the uh, framers had about uh, whether there should be uh, a president of the United States or several people in, to lead the executive and how long that person should serve or those people should serve. Can you respond to that please? Yes, if you look towards what we initially had under the Articles of Confederation, there was a technical president, but he had zero power, much like the Congress of the Articles of Confederation. And especially from their 
their fear of a monarch and their fear of a king and a strong executive under British rule during the revolution, they knew that going forward, whatever federal government needed to have a system of checks and balances to where that executive position would not have the ability to become a tyrant that they had under the British parliament. So there were many founders to more directly answer your question who did push for the single person executive that we do have today, such as John Adams and Alexander Hamilton. John Adams even wanted to push so far to have um, the president be addressed with a sort of title of nobility because of how they saw the systems under Britain, which is at the time one of the greatest empires, one of the ones that they'd ever known. And so with that system seeming to be working, um, founders such as them wanted to have this one person executive to have a more stable government. To add on to my colleague, the titles of nobility was actually prohibited with Article 1, Section 9, Clause 8. But we've also seen that after the Philadelphia Convention, they appointed George Washington as the first president of the United States. And after his two terms, he decided to set step down instead of taking a third term. And that was kind of set a precedent for a two-termed presidency. So if I were to posit to you that arguments about the right to privacy and the need for an amendment are sort of overblown in that, frankly, if people would take the trouble to read what they are agreeing to when they uh, sign up for all of these apps and things, then nobody would be in their business because they could say, nope, I don't want you to do that. That the right to privacy says, don't come in my house unless I want you to. I think the protections are there. Why do we need to do that? Why don't we just tell people, read before you sign? Yep. So our proposal to the amendment of privacy is actually modeled after House Bill 57 in the Utah State Legislature, which is the Data Privacy Act, which allows citizens the protection of their information collected by third parties and the government has to get a warrant in order to access that information. Here in Washington state, we actually have the Washington Privacy Act, which is um, Senate Bill 6182, which gives citizens the ability to collect the information collected by the government, but not third parties. And there's a current bill being passed on the House floor in Washington state state senate bill 5062 which allows citizens the ability to go through and choose their information that they want to give the 30 party third party third parties and be able to go through and actually go change or redact any of that information and i would go farther to sorry to, I would go farther to more directly answer your question as to why we don't just tell people to read the terms and conditions, to go through and look at what they're actually signing when they accept cookies, when they accept whatever terms and conditions that a website needs. But in our society, we are moving so far, so quickly towards a more internet-based form of communication. For this class, you know, I had to sign up. I had to make a Facebook. I never had a Facebook before, but I had to agree to the terms and conditions. And though there are questionable things within them, I could not join this class without having that. And so I think, yes, people do need to be more educated on what they are signing away when they agree to terms and conditions, but the necessity of leaning on these big companies such as Facebook, Google, Instagram, things like that, we have to hold the, count the companies themselves accountable because ultimately we are moving forward in technology with them. And just one furthering on my colleague's point, it's become adamant the fact that I think we can all agree that this, this new age of technology and this new idea of a new public square has become so vital, especially what we saw with our press, with the last presidency of the Donald Trump administration and how much they utilized Twitter in order to reach out information and to make sure that the public was informed about any decisions or actions within the house. So if my, the last point I want to make on this one, if we don't want to be, have our whole country become Alabama with the Constitution amended 850,000 times, why don't we just go ahead and pass a law? Why don't we protect the Constitution by limiting what we do it and have Congress pass legislation requiring simplified language? Why does it have to be a constitutional amendment? I would argue that 
what we have in our constitution in America sets our values as a country, what we move forward with, which is why personally I think it's problematic that we still have like the three-fifths clause, for example, it's not used, but it's within the constitution under article one, section two, clause three. By putting privacy in the constitution as an amendment and not just a law, we move forward as a country and say, we value privacy. We care about it enough to put it in our founding document and put it in something more concrete than just a law, not that a law isn't important, but it's a more of a moral argument that we care about it as a country. Okay. And to add to my, oh, sorry, to add to my colleague about this, in the Washington State Constitution under Article 1, Section 7, the right to privacy is actually protected within that. And with that, we have seen how the different rights of privacy, for example, the Privacy Act I was talking about mentioned earlier, or with our right to private garbage, which was established in State v. Boland, we have seen how the right to privacy has actually been able to like, be interpreted in more broad situations and has granted citizens more rights. Yeah, interesting. Um, I think uh, if we had a, a little more time, um, how would I phrase this? Uh, we kind of circle back and ask you about your proposal about the electoral college issues and reform there. Uh, do you have a 25 word answer? The electoral college itself is a system that was established when you had your constituents very close to them, the electors as far as we were dispersed across the country. A modern electoral college would need to see a, a bigger transition to more of a congressional district method. Is it okay if I conclude my sentence? Yeah would need to move to a congressional district method to have a better representation of the constituents. Okay, uh, interesting. Uh, I'm not sure we've had anybody take this kind of track on uh, these questions and these issues. So it was sort of interesting to hear uh, how this group thought through the problems. Uh, my question about the 14th Amendment is that once it's an amendment, it's part of the Constitution, maybe not the 1787 Constitution, but issues of citizenships and what the states shall not do, the second sentence of the 14th Amendment. So I was just trying to pu push you towards thinking about the Constitution in a slightly broader way, just to clarify where I was going with that one, because I kind of stumped you a little bit there, but that's okay. Look, you, you listened to the questions, you took a position into Defend it. You clearly are engaged with these issues. Uh, I like that. I thought you handled uh, these tough questions uh, that people have struggled with uh, in, in a very sophisticated fashion. So uh, I thought it was a pretty good job. Nicely done. Um, I'd like to uh, commend you for your focus on the issue of privacy as a, an area where a constitutional amendment might be appropriate. We haven't heard that uh, all day. I, I, people have discussed the issue of the right of privacy is a very important, uh, increasingly important issue because of all of the technological issues that, that you mentioned in your discussion. Um, having said that, um, you know, Griswold v. Connecticut that you mentioned was, was not a criminal case. So your proposal to uh, amend the, to extend the Fourth Amendment uh, is interesting, but I don't know if if uh, the Griswold issue or decision itself might not protect the right to privacy. Uh, but we had a good discussion about that, which I, I enjoyed. I particularly enjoyed your reference to the right to privacy and garbage because the Colorado Supreme Court in one of the few decisions where it's deviated from the United States Supreme Court has said, that there is a constitutional right to privacy in your trash. So that's not as far-fetched as an issue as, as you might uh, think. Um, the, uh, I like your discussion about the executive and about um, the, the vagueness of article two and um, your reference to the, the, the fact that titles of nobility are prohibited in the constitution. You might have mentioned the debates uh, among the founders about whether there should be one person as the uh, president or several people, um, but uh, that's a, a relatively minor point. My last comment is that um, to Caitlin and Sophia that uh, if you, I appreciate your uh, 
saying that your heroes were Washington and Hamilton. And if you haven't read them, I would commend to you the, their biographies by Ron Chernow, which are very well written and comprehensive. But you probably have to wait till a break from school before you'd have enough time to read them. But they're both uh, books, uh, biographies that I would strongly recommend. And congratulations to all three of you for doing a very good job this afternoon. I tend to take a certain amount of liberty when I get to judge the Washington team by saying that I will assume that by virtue of being a Seattle U alum that I have the right to take a certain amount of pride in you. And uh, you didn't do anything that put a dent on that halo that uh, <laughs> was just fun listening to you. Um, I in all honesty, I really like the fact that you started out and said, okay, we need to mention the Articles of Confederation and we need to talk about the Virginia plan, the New Jersey plan, the Great Compromise, the House of Representatives. And you said, okay, let's get that out of the way because we got some stuff we want to talk about. I like the way you did that. Um, and, you know, mentioning that, okay, citizenship, no, nope, didn't quite work through that. Supreme Court talked about it with Dred Scott. Um, it was still got some stuff to do on that. There have been people who have mentioned um, difficulties post reconstruction. I don't remember hearing anybody explicitly discuss the slave codes uh, before. And I, I appreciate that that was part of the discussion. I have often felt as I have listened to the conversations, don't forget the women. Um, you know, Starberg, Abigail Adams started that way back then remember the ladies, you know, uh, that there were times, because remember, there was some pre-Constitution ladies who were voting and they lost that right, just like there were some free Blacks in North Carolina voting up until the 1805 Constitution. So we've had a, a really troubled period in figuring out how we want to handle that. And the same thing with uh, Native Americans in our country, uh, exactly whether they count, when they can vote. We've struggled with that one. So there were some pieces that I thought could have filled in, uh, but having said that, you did well, and your technology-based amendment suggestion was so much the difference in you all being young people saying, this is a big problem, and me being old saying, I ain't on Facebook. So it, this is... <laughs> This was really good. I enjoyed it so much. Congratulations again and good luck to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, let's go. Thank you. Thank you. And the, the joke about John Adams, his rotundity was the joke that they would be called instead of his majesty, but it's okay. Uh, good luck, y'all. Nicely done. All right.